am in the company of the legendary Rob Law MBE, founder of Magmatic. Any parents listening will immediately know about his brand, whether your tots have the trunky, the ride-on suitcase, or perhaps the booster seat slash backpack. He is an incredible innovator, designing products to help harassed parents on the move. Today on Sound Advice Entrepreneurs Unfiltered, we are going to hear Rob's story about how copycats almost destroyed his business, how he fought back and lost, but then came back again, Phoenix-like, to rebuild his brand from the ashes, finally selling it earlier this year. This is a story of determination, heartbreak, and absolute grit. Welcome, Rob. Thank you for being on the show. Hi, Bex. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's so nice to catch up with you because there was a time in 2014, 2015, where we were speaking about two or three times a month. You were on the front cover of the small business section of the Telegraph. You were like my number one cover star. So it's great to be (laughs) sitting here and find out what happened next. Um, But maybe we'll start at the beginning. So you are a true inventor. I think you came up with the idea for the Trunky at university. So how did you take that idea from uh, just a complete wild thought to reality yeah i came up with the idea back in 97 while i was studying product design at university so actually i was being trained in the skill set to be able to take ideas all the way through to being a physical product um so i was able to create the product design the product in cad and had a prototype that i handcrafted myself and i sort of pimped that around various manufacturers from luggage manufacturers who politely told me I'd invented a toy and toy manufacturers told me I'd invented some luggage and I really struggled to find anyone to take it on, like to license my idea. Um, Eventually I found a a toy company to take it on. They didn't do a very good job and went bust and frustrated by this lack of success, I decided to have a go myself. And on the 5th of May, 2006, now celebrated as Trunky's birthday. That's when the first container of pink and blue trunkies arrived in Avonmouth docks. I quit my job as a design consultant and started trading. And what did parents, what did kids think about this product? Because there was nothing else like it around at the time, right? Yeah, well, funnily enough, manufacturers didn't get it. Uh, Retailers didn't get it. Investors didn't get it. But finally, when I got in front of the target customer, they loved it. So kids and parents absolutely loved the product. And that was kind of proved in principle when I was rejected off Dragon's Den, but um, went on to sell quite a few of them. Now, tell me about that experience, because Peter Jones called your company worthless. Am I remembering this right? So what was the impact of being on the show? Yeah, I certainly remember that quote. It's <laughs> kind of etched on my memory. But the, the I mean, the impact of the show was, it was, it was six months before it actually aired. Um, so I had a bit of time to build the business. We literally, only, in all fairness to the BBC, we only filmed that two weeks after that first container arrived. So I'd, I was still sat in my bedroom, a single man, one man band, trying to get Trunky into retailers and being passed around all these different departments because no one would take the bloody product. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Dragon's Den was a great opening to get our brand out there and the next day after it aired even though the BBC advertised the episode as wheelie rubbish uh, everyone was talking about Trunky Van the coffee machine at work and we started selling an absolute shed load and retailers finally picked up the the phone and invited me in to pitch so that was a real turning point but did it give me any determination to succeed Uh, probably not because I'd faced so much adversity beforehand that this was just another challenge to overcome and by then I was kind of fairly seasoned at just getting on with it and um, trying to overcome these these curveballs I kept getting thrown. Well there was more adversity ahead because it could be said that all that attention perhaps drew some attention from some copycats and people who thought I'll have a slice of that that's doing really well so what happened? Well it took a couple of years before we started I started seeing copies um primarily because there's quite a large investment in the steel tools that make a large plastic product like this. So it was only when we started getting real success internationally that we started getting copied. And we've had over 56 copies now from all over the world, mainly the Far East. Uh, One particular copy was um, fashioned by a a UK company that normally go after, they're renowned for copying people and they copy anyone who's successful. And when I saw this on our home turf, I thought these could be quite a serious threat. So talking to my lawyers, um, we decided to to send them a cease and desist letter. But as they're um, seasoned professionals at copying, that that means nothing to them. And very early on, I was told that if I wanted to 
take these guys on I should be prepared to take it all the way and uh, not <laughs> naively I didn't quite realize that all the way might actually mean going all the way to the Supreme Court <laughs> in London so yeah we we, um, we managed to get a European injunction against their product which means they had to set, stop selling it all over Europe uh, we went to the High Court and we won I thought that was game over mm. they appealed on a technicality that technicality got overthrown uh, so then they won and we owed them all their lost revenue from that European injunction um, and damages so that that just felt really unfair so talking to my lawyers it was like what can we do next and they're like there's only one more option here and we, we just have to take it all the way to the Supreme Court and this would only be the I think the second ever design case ever heard in the Supreme Court so we did a bit of a rallying cry got some celebrity designers behind us from Kevin McLeod and Jasper Conran and people to kind of voice our concern over this interpretation on design law and how unfair it was and eventually we got our, our day in court so a very bizarre day or a couple of days sat with the most experienced judges in the land with all these brightly colored suitcases around them uh, pondering over how to interpret design registrations um, so yeah that was um, that was interesting and a few months later when they handed down their judgment we uh, found out we had lost um, and it was an incredibly expensive court battle that cost well over a million quid and it's only the lawyers that win in the end <laughs> so so that was really frustrating but kind of being hit by that it was kind of well, that's the end of the road there's nowhere else I can take this I could just cry in the corner forever or I could just put it behind me move on and and carry on building my brand because at the end of the day I've created a brand not a, just a product and everyone who's copied us has just created a, copy, a product and not a brand so we, we had the strength of our brand and and funnily enough on the day the judgment was handed down we featured in every single national newspaper with a full colour picture of our products talking about how damaging this was to the design community but not that we were just on the brink of going bust because we'd spent a million quid on these legal fees. Mm. And it was really smart because that campaign that you mentioned where you got the likes of, yeah, Kevin McLeod and it was the Brompton Bikes boss, Will Butler yeah. Adams, Sean Palfrey from Tangle Teaser. It was all these great British designers saying, if you don't support British innovation, they're all going to go out of business. So it was quite an amazing rallying cry um, f for the whole industry. Um, what made you come up with that particular plan of attack? Because that was sort of inspired well, I, I kind of, when they first came on the market and we started getting people on Facebook saying, oh, my trunkie's broken when it wasn't a trunkie, it was one of these counterfeit products. Um, I just felt I needed to let more people know. And when we started talking to the press about this, it turned out that no brand really talks about being copied. So it was mm. a whole new uh, genre of discussion to be had uh, with the press. And we got loads of column inches on the lead up to, to the various um, legal sort of cases we, we had. Um, so knowing that we had that kind of support from the media, it, it kind of just felt that we, we should keep going down that route, really. And how did you come back from that challenging time, not just as a businessman, but as an individual? Because you'd spent two years fighting, as you mentioned, huge amount of money, but massive distraction from the business, from your life. So how did you regain your passion? How did you find the energy and the strength to keep going? Yeah, I remember when the judgment was handed down, I wasn't in the UK, I was actually in Hong Kong on a, a trip to the Far East. But I'd met up with a, a good university friend of mine who was living out there and kind of drowned my sorrows for a night on in Lak Wai Fung. And then, um, yeah, then it was just, well, we've got a business to run, so let's, let's keep going. And there were still more opportunities. That particular product was really bad quality and uh, they'd been kicked out of Tesco's because they kept breaking, so I wasn't too threatened by that product taking up much more of our market share um, the frustrating thing from losing that court battle was it made it much harder then to get other counterfeits taken down mm. so the likes of Lidl and Aldi have created their own ones and it's quite funny it looks like Lidl's copying Aldi or vice versa <laughs> so and um, they just keep copying all our designs fire engines pirate ships um, so it's, it's, it's just frustrating but but now it's just part of being a successful brand I guess 
But you went back to the drawing board and came up with another hit product that I see everywhere, the, the booster pack. Tell me about how you kind of came back using innovation, go back to the drawing board, back to your own innovative ideas to kind of move the company forward. Yeah, well, the, the booster pack had been out for quite a while. Um, I think the, the scooters is a good example. So um, we got massively hit financially with those legal fees. So I had to make a couple of redundancies, had to lose my design team. Uh, I didn't have the ability to develop products anymore, really. Um, but I have had young kids at the time and I was always using a trunky tow strap when I was taking them up out to the shops on their scooters and balance bikes and towing them along because they always got tired. So then there was a kind of a, a slightly different moment for me where I actually discovered there was an opportunity through my personal experience rather than talking to parents about their travel woes and thought there's a real opportunity to, although scooters and balance bikes are really cool products for kids, no one had actually really created a solution that addresses the parents' need, mm -hmm. which is you always have to throw these things over the buggies and the scoot, the prams and kids get tired so you need to pull them along. So actually just something as simple as a t chunky tow strap to tow them along and then to allow <clears throat> a shoulder carrying solution and also something you could hook over the, the buggy seemed like a great idea um uh and playing around with the, these kind of ideas that was just going to be really hard to try and launch a product ourselves it would take a huge amount of work and capital to bring us to market we didn't know the sport and outdoor buyers of all the retailers most of our distributors were in the baby space so kind of thinking how can we try and get this to market I came up with the idea of licensing the trunky brand um to a large retailer so we talked to Halfords who are the biggest reseller of scooters in the UK and uh, they were really keen on the idea of partnering up with us so we kind of jointly designed um, a folding scooter that used the trunky toe strap to provide all these solutions for parents and, and went to market that way so it didn't cost us a penny to bring that to market other than my time and, um, and it was a big success and we've sold tens and tens of thousands of them since. That's great advice. And actually, I'd like to talk a bit about how costly it is to invent new products, because you mentioned not having a team behind you um, because you had costs to pay in the business. So tell me, why is it so expensive to invent new products and how you have found clever ways to mitigate, mitigate those costs? I know that you were a big fan for a while of the R&D tax credit, for example. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, it was, it's very expensive to bring a product to market because you've got to invest that time and effort in, in developing that product, whether that you, you do that internally with your own team or whether you outsource that con to consultants. And there's no guarantee that product's going to be success. So you create all you put all this time and effort into creating something um, and you try and test the market throughout that process. I think there's a big, a big kind of falsity out there that kind of when you come up with an idea you've got to keep it quiet and not tell anyone and get all these patents and ip protection around them if you don't talk to people about your ideas you don't know if they're going to be commercially successful mm. and your idea is never the final idea you've got to keep iterating a bit like software go through alpha beta and um, different um, stages of product development and you can only go through those stages once you've gathered feedback from the target market mm. so we've always had a very open approach getting parental feedback not being too worried about the kind of the high level patentability of products to some extent because it's just so expensive. So once you've developed your product, if you do have a patentable aspect, this is another thing I think people just don't quite understand, and that is patents are incredibly expensive and they're only valid in the countries you apply for. So if you have a UK patent, that means the rest of the world can copy your product, sell it in all the markets apart from the UK. So then you've got to patent the product in every single market that you think is going to be commercially viable mainly the UK, China, US and Europe and then you're up to tens and tens of thousands of pounds per year just in patenting fees um, so so that, that, that's a whole other conversation I guess but I think for, for me my, my advice really around intellectual property would be around it's the power of brand that is the most valuable aspect of your business um, and if you can really drive the value of that brand and invest in the trademarking of that brand around the world rather than so much patenting, you can do a few design registrations um, to try and protect the shape of your product. And that's what actually our big legal battle was all around. Um, but yeah, building a brand, because that's the value. That's what people want to eventually acquire from, from you in the future is the, the brand, not, not so much patents. Mm. So for me, it was 
it was really important just to invest in the marketing aspect and building that brand and the, the, the sort of our, our customers who, who love the, the product and the brand. That's a really good point, especially for startup founders, because even if they could afford to patent in all markets and had that kind of resource, if someone infringes, you still have to have yet more money in the bank for legal fees in order to defend your patent. So it's not even that it's a done and dusted thing. Once you have your patent, you're safe. There's still a whole other expensive world out there um, if there is an infringement. So I love that, that advice to focus on your brand and to just stay in front of everyone else rather than trying to like desperately defend your position. Yeah, um, keep innovating. I mean, what, one thing that I kind of reflected on over this business journey of 17 odd years is actually being a product designer, you always want to innovate and create something really, really unique. But actually, you can you can kind of do it in stages. So a safer solution is to, if you if you spot a, a niche in the market or a gap in the market, to just bring out maybe a Me Too product with a one or two small improvements just to mm. get going, a very low risk to entry kind of um, solution, with the idea of having something much more innovative to launch in the future. And once you start building market traction and gaining some profitability, you can then start reinvesting that in doing the next iteration and the next iteration and actually if you're trying to stop people copying you you can keep them having to copy previous versions all the time um, mm -hmm. and that, that may be a, a sensible solution to to try and um, yeah bring bring a product to market by doing it gradually yeah that's smart and I suppose also being aware that if something isn't selling being quite quick to sort of kill it as a product line um, have you ever had to do that? Um, <clears throat> yes, we had a, a teen trunky called Journey, which we launched, and that was a huge investment uh, back in 2017. We raised loads of money on Indiegogo, uh, and it was a sit-on hard plastic suitcase for teenagers or tweens to keep their tech really easy uh, to hand. It had a pod. It was really, really innovative, loads of cool features, um, and, and it turned out adults international business travelers really saw the opportunity really liked the product but it was only 80 pounds and it was designed for kids not for international business travelers so we started getting quite a few slatings in our reviews um because the wrong market was buying the product <laughs> and unfortunately it led to a bit of a falling out with my investors and they they decided we should can the product well, that was a loaded question because I have a journey. I still well, have well, it well. with its hot pink <laughs> edging. I've had it for almost 10 years. So I was just, I was just looking, I was like, whatever happened to the journey? But it turns out my, mine is like, it's like a cult item now. They don't make them anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. And you mentioned fighting adversity at every point in your business journey. And so I have to ask about the pandemic because obviously your products are all about travel and suddenly there were no flights. Um, all your products are pretty much, um, well, most of them are in the travel space. So how did you cope and what did that experience teach you? And how did that make the business more resilient um, in the aftermath? Well, I kind of had a, a minor experience of that way back in the day when the uh... At the height of the terrorist threats, the government banned hand luggage because um, mm. of the liquid bomb threats. Um, and the, the the summer I launched Trunky, but no one could take a Trunky on as hand luggage because hand luggage was banned. Um, and from that experience, I've really learned to cut costs and to try and pivot the marketing message. So when COVID hit, we, we did see a bit of a canary in the coal mine. We look at our rate of sale data uh, and on Amazon in Italy and Spain, we kind of saw the sales just completely fall through the floor. And then it was just a matter of time. So we started planning, sadly, to, to make some cuts and redundancies. And literally a day before we were about to make the announcement, the Chancellor announced the furlough scheme. So fortunately, half the team were kind of saved for a while. But yeah, we had a huge drop in sales. I was actually surprised that we're still selling any trunkies during COVID because no one was traveling. And then when people could get out of the house and start visiting grandparents and things, we saw a little bit of a bump. But it was, it was basically two years of just trying to ride it out um trying to obviously i couldn't influence when go when travel was going to be in so it's just trying to not worry too much about that and just try and make sure the cash flow would last as long as possible and try and save as much cost and as much as i'd like to have marketed our brand still to homeschooling and trying to offer advice to parents it just didn't feel relevant anymore so we just mm -hmm. had to pretty much go into hibernation um for a while and just just ride the storm yeah. And then when it when um, sales started coming back, 
we were able to then pull some of the team back online and start trading again. And how quickly did kind of the revenues rise? I mean, because there was sort of a boom, wasn't there, when everyone was like, hooray, I'm free, get me out. But, um, but, uh, but perhaps not so much parents with kids because you're kind of constrained a little bit. Um, summer holidays must be a massive boom time for you guys, right? Yeah, so seasonality-wise, we kind of see um, things pick up around Easter and then it's fairly constant with a bit more of a pick, pick up for the lead up to the summer holidays, drops down a bit in October and then massively ramps up for a really big peak for Christmas. Um, so actually, because we're manufacturing in the UK, we were able to, it was, we were able to avoid the perfect storm of ridiculously high shipping costs. I mean, it cost almost more, a lot more than it cost to buy the, a trunky to ship it back to the UK from China, but we weren't doing that anymore. We were manufacturing in the UK. And also the ramp up in demand was so quick that we had no idea it was going to bounce back so strong. So domestically manufacturing, we were able to try and maximise that opportunity with being able to turn on the stock a lot quicker. Um, so if we were still manufacturing in China, we'd, we'd never have been able to meet the demand. It wouldn't have been worth us meeting the demand because it would cost so much to ship stuff. So actually the UK factory was an absolute lifesaver for us um, throughout COVID. And tell me about that decision to manufacture in the UK, because you sort of made that decision at a time when a lot of UK manufacturers were doing exactly the opposite. They were all outsourcing. Um, so what made you decide to go the perhaps slightly more expensive route, shall we say, and, and make things here? Yeah, I was just getting really frustrated and not seeing how much things were really costing me because of the exchange rate fluctuations, the shipping costs, the fuel surcharges. There's so many moving parts in this global supply chain. That, and we had a few big hiccups with, um, I think it was, what was it, 2009 when the US dollar massively appreciated against the pound and we, we were finding our products were 50% more expensive to make in China. So a couple of those learnings, it was like, well, let's find out how much it actually does cost to manufacture in Europe. Uh, and we found a really competitive quote in the UK from a factory. And it was pretty much the same cost as our landed cost from China. So taking add on the cost of shipping and duty and it, and it came in around about the same. So then it kind of made sense to do it. We had to re-engineer the product to make it very cost effective to make in the UK. So we took out all the metal parts and it just snap fits together. So it's very quick and easy to assemble. Um, and as a result, we ended up with a great product that's really kind of environmentally friendly because it's fully recyclable 100% plastic and it's now manufactured using 100% green energy as well and you sold the business earlier this year so tell me about that journey what made you decide to go that route and I'm right in thinking that you are staying with the business um, post deal right so tell me a bit about your decision to sell and the impact on you as a founder when you've kind of got a hand over your baby uh, having gone through COVID, it kind of put a few things in perspective and um, the business journey hadn't been much fun for a while because of the way we had been funded um, and it was just time to get rid of our previous in investment partners and try and look to the future and move, move, move the business forward. So we looked to sell the business last year and... Um, yeah, we found a really couple of really interesting companies that it wasn't a traditional trade sale as we thought it might be. They're these new Amazon aggregator type businesses that buy brands um, that primarily sell on Amazon. And um, they had a very exciting technology driven business and they really saw the value of not just selling their products on Amazon, but trying to sell them off Amazon, which is where we came in because we have a, a great network of retailers and distributors around the world. Um, so it kind of was almost symbiotic uh, to, to partner up with these guys. So they acquired the business and uh, invited me to stay on as general manager. And and there's still an unfinished goal of mine to conquer the US. So uh, with their backing, I was really keen to stick around and try and take on America for the third time and see if we could win this time round. And there's still other products that are yet to be developed and launched under the Trunky brand. So. Uh, a bit like Steve Jobs once said, I think it's all about the journey, not the destination. So I'm just really enjoying the journey part uh, and not thinking too much about the end. Did you feel reinvigorated by that deal? Because it's sort of a validation when you kind of have people slapping their money on the table for everything that you've built up with the brand. But also then you're sharing the risk a bit. You're sharing the burdens as well as the rewards. 
Yeah, the, all the challenges we've had over the years, it's nice to now not have bear the full responsibility of that um, and to have your hands freed up a bit more to, to really finally focus in on a couple of areas that you're really passionate about from e-commerce to um, product development and marketing. Mm. So more of the back office stuff's being taken care of and we're able to sort of pioneer forward um, really looking to the future. And I find it really fascinating speaking to founders and and seeing who they sort of lean on and who is almost like a kind of silent or quiet partner that is supporting them over the long term. And I did notice that you've had the same chairman for a decade or more, Trevor Bell. Can you tell me about that? How you found him? What the impact of that relationship? Yeah, well, Tre Trevor joined the business just before. Uh, we did a private equity round in 2012, I think. I pulled him in as an international sales consult consultant. Uh, when we did a private equity deal, he then joined the board as a non-exec. Uh, and after the first chairman didn't quite work out, he ended up jumping into the chairman's shoes, I forget exactly how long ago, at least five plus years ago. So yeah, he's been, uh, he's been really useful, uh, along with my MD as well, MD Jones, who um, the three of us kind of ran the business together. So, yeah, it's a really good sort of partnership between the three of us. Okay, amazing. And just finally, Rob, if you could kind of give the young version of yourself some advice um, on how to, to, to go on the journey uh, with Magmatic again, but make fewer mistakes or have a smoother run, like what would the advice be that you would give yourself? Oh, that's an easy one. You could just buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. The Excellent promo there. Tell us about the book. Tell us about the book. So, so the book um, is is kind of a, a roller coaster ride that I've been on around my business journey, but also some deeper insights into my personal background. So it's called Sixty Five Roses and the Trunky because I actually have cystic fibrosis. Was born with the disease, and children struggle with its pronunciation, so they quite often refer to it as Sixty Five Roses. Uh, so it's a, a story that starts with losing my twin sister when we were 16 to the disease and how that kind of that experience really shaped me and influenced me and kind of gave me a very valuable life lesson that life is short and you've got to make the most of it. So ever since that, that time, I've been very focused and determined to try and succeed and try and find my way in life. And uh, that's kind of work so many times with a lot of the adversity I've I've had to face it's like it, it puts it into perspective to some extent so you can just crack on and try and overcome it and not lose too much time worrying about stuff I guess so yeah there's quite a few interesting lessons in there that I've kind of reflected back on and uh, and share in the book because it's true I guess the death of a sibling it and nothing else that you might experience when running a company can come close, I would imagine. And if you've managed to get through that time in your life and like keep on fighting, you must feel like you can pretty much do anything. Yeah, it's certainly given me a huge amount of tenacity and drive. Um, and I guess I probably do see things in a slightly different light to most people. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's definitely helped me just keep plowing forward with with all these challenges we faced um and another really valuable lesson was just kind of uh, there are lots of things out there that you can't influence and people always trying to get through challenges requires a huge amount of mo mental determination and strength and if you waste it worrying about things you just have no influence on then you're just not going to have the resource and the internal power to to get through the challenge that's right in front of you so trying to block that out um, and not, not lose too much sleep over the things you can't control and really focusing on the ones that you actually can. That's brilliant advice, Rob. I think that's probably a great place for us to stop. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been fantastic to have you. Cheers, Pex. Thanks. How amazing to have Rob Law on the show. Huge thanks for sharing the story. He's on LinkedIn and he has his own website, roblaw.com. If you are inspired, terrified or furious on his behalf, all of the above, come and tell us either in the comments, wherever you get your podcasts, or on Instagram, X or LinkedIn, using the hashtag soundadvicepodcast. He has a new book out, so make sure you buy that. See you next week with the final episode of the season. Thanks for listening.